good. All right. Well, welcome everyone. My name is Tina Bernard. I'm Executive Director of Development here at Murray State. I'm also a proud alumna of uh, today's Byron Fine College of Business Featured Department, which is the Department of Organizational Communication and Leadership. Uh, so welcome everyone to today's series. This is a part of our fall 2020 virtual event series called Racers in the Lead. Uh, and this virtual lecture series features alumni who are serving their organizations as top executives uh, as they provide our racer community with career guidance and perspective and reassurance during this challenging time. So today's event is being recorded. So anyone who's registered for the event uh, is able to, uh, to access it afterward. Uh, and then also we can share that with students and classes as well. So that's a nice uh, tool to be able to have in our toolbox. Uh, as you have questions during today's event, if you would just please submit them via the chat function. Uh, and then at the end of Trisha's uh, presentation, we'll go ahead and ask those questions so that we can uh, get them answered for you. The best uh, view of today's event is using speaker view as a part of the Zoom meeting, uh, and that you can find that option at the top of your Zoom screen. I also want to mention again, we're having internet issues on campus today. So uh, from our perspective here in uh, Command Central for today's event, we've got several internet options. So if we suddenly bleep off, it's okay, just wait uh, or sign back in and we will go ahead uh, and get that running up and up and running within just a couple seconds. So we've got several options here to make sure that we stay connected and finish uh, today's presentation. Uh, it's also the lunch hour. So if you did have your meal, uh, please feel free to enjoy that during today's presentation. So I'd like to briefly introduce a few racers. Our Director of Alumni Relations, Carrie McGinnis, is on the call today. So hello, Carrie. And I'm wearing my new uh, Murray State University Lifetime Membership uh, pin for the Alumni Association. So thank you for that. Uh, Interim Dean Eaton from the Barnfine College of Business will be joining us as soon as his class is out, so just shortly. Uh, the Chair of the Department of Organizational Communication and Leadership is Dr. Mike Bacchino, and he's on the call today. Also joining us are two members of my team, Melanie Brooks, the De Director of Development for the College of Education and Human Services. Our Director of Development for the Barnfine College of Business is Brian Cannerty, and they both have something to do with today's event. We are going to have some other special event, uh, special guests uh, that we will introduce following the presentation. It's very important, so please stick around to the very end today. Uh, I promise you, you won't be disappointed. So moderating today's session uh, will be Robin Esau. She is an instructor in Murray State's University Nonprofit Leadership Studies Program. And Robin uh, has been on our nonprofit leadership uh, faculty since 2014. She holds a certified nonprofit professional credential, the leading national nonprofit management credential in the United States. Uh, and she is a member of the Kentucky Nonprofit Network and is involved with local community nonprofits and governing boards, as well as the university. She received both her bachelor's and master's from Murray State, so she's an alumna as well. Uh, and she has held leadership position in positions in children and youth ministries. Uh, Robin, thank you for leading our discussion today, and I'll get it off to you right here. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Tina. I appreciate you inviting me to be a part of this conversation today. Uh, the nonprofit leadership studies program has a rich history at Murray State, which began in 1983. The program initially was offered only as a minor, but over time it became extremely popular and the demand so great that in 2012 the program was expanded to include a full major in addition to the minor. Alumni from our program are working across the nonprofit sector, both at home and abroad, doing incredible work and we could not be more proud of the impact they're making. So today, it is such an honor to have a racer leading a nonprofit, the caliber of the North Texas Food Bank, with us to share some of her expertise and perspectives. So I'd like to take a minute to formally introduce you to our guest. Tricia Cunningham holds a BS in Computer Information Systems with the emphasis in marketing and business from Murray State University. Her husband, Greg, and her reside in Fairview, and they have two grown children, Chris and Carrie. Trisha was appointed president and chief executive officer of the North Texas Food Bank in 2017. Prior to joining the food bank, she had a distinguished career at Texas Instruments, most recently serving as chief citizenship officer. 
Through her work in this role, Trisha significantly expanded their corporate citizenship work and philanthropic efforts, most notably increasing volunteer efforts 13-fold during her tenure. Because of Trisha and her team's efforts, TI climbed up CR's magazine top 100 corporate citizenship annual rankings, coming in at number 15 on the list in 2017. In addition to having a keen understanding of corporate culture, philanthropy, and sustainability efforts, Trisha is also very well versed in marketing and communications, having served as a top communications leader for TI both locally and abroad. Trisha has a vast amount of experience with local nonprofits and has an executive certificate in nonprofit management through the University of Texas at Dallas Institute for Excellence in Corporate Governance. Some of the boards and organizations she has been affiliated with include Leadership Women, Girl Scouts of Northeast Texas, Volunteer Now, Girls Inc. of Metropolitan Dallas, founder of DFW Corporate Citizenship Network, advisory board of the Institute for Innovation and Entrepreneurship, and she has served with numerous leadership organizations. Trisha has also earned numerous awards and recognition for her service to the community. In her role as CEO at the office at the North Texas Food Bank, Trisha brings 30 years of corporate social responsibility marketing and communications expertise through her work at Texas Instruments, where she leads nearly 200 employees in their work to provide access to healthy foods for food insecure individuals across their 13 county service area. Tricia, we want to welcome you today. Oh, Robin, thank you so much. I mean, gosh, that's way too much info that they, they really needed for, for this conversation, but I appreciate the the conversation there. Uh, it's great to be back home. Great to be back in Murray. I grew up in Murray, Kentucky and and uh, went to Callaway County High School. So I'm a native there. So it's so great to see everyone online today. I hope to be able to, to you know, one of the things Tina told me about whenever we took this, that it's right before the holidays and it's sort of that season of service. And so I'm hoping that you know, my background and experience and can help inspire maybe a few people to be bold in your community to make them stronger as well. That's wonderful. We know that you've held the corporate role with Texas Instruments and now lead a nonprofit role. Can you tell us about those corporate experiences? You know, I feel very fortunate um, through having been at TI for 30 years. I started off in Houston right out of Murray State, right out of college and uh, went down there and was there for 13 years and had two different roles. And I was in the semiconductor business. So for those techies online, I see a few of you there um, that you know I was in semiconductors and started in the memory business then went to more of the processor side. And then I met more into the corporate area. And it was whenever I went more into the corporate roles that I moved to Dallas. And so we've been here in the Dallas area since 99. But I think you know, TI what, has a great culture it's a global organization. So I had the opportunity through that role to really go to all parts of the world and to see what the needs were in those communities. And what I found was that the, our employees had a passion for making their community better. They wanted it to be stronger. That was our culture at TI. And so whenever I was able to move into that chief citizenship officer role for the last seven or so years there that I was at TI, it really gave us an opportunity to scale that program on a global basis. So I had responsibility not only for volunteerism and giving and employee giving, but also sustainability. And how do you sustain? And I really do firmly believe that part of sustainability is making your community sustainable because you can't be strong as a business unless you have a strong community and workforce for your business as well. Absolutely, great points. When you were at Murray State, you worked in our program, which at the time was called American Humanics, and where their students are trained to become nonprofit professionals. So did you think you would become a nonprofit executive one day, and was that part of your career? You know, there's only one way that you could describe my career progression, and that was divine intervention. There was absolutely no way I could have orchestrated this myself. Uh, you know, I was the first administrative assistant uh, to Phil Jackowitz in the American Humanics Department, 
and I was working 20 hours a week. We were, had an office in the women's athletic department there. And, uh, but it was fun. It was exciting to see these students, even at that time, who were interested in having a career in an organization um, that they felt like that they could do something to make a difference. I think you're seeing more and more students today that want that purpose part of their, your, your role. And I believe firmly that you can have purpose both in a corporate or professional role as well as in the nonprofit role. You just have to figure out how to make that happen. But no, there's no way as I was sitting there and I literally was typing the internship guide for uh, the students who were gonna be going out and doing internships at the, you know, all across the country, no way that I ever thought that I would end up being a nonprofit executive. So it's pretty interesting how that sort of became full circle. Sure. Could you tell us that story about coming to the North Texas Food Bank and that transition from the corporate to the nonprofit world? You know, I came to the food bank, it was, you know, 30 years at TI. And you know, you when you have those monumentals, we were, uh, Dr. Bacchino and I were talking a little bit before that, you know, every decade sort of brings its own new challenges. And I think that's the same thing whenever you're in a, in a long-term career as well. You look and you think, you know, am I still challenged? Am I still contributing? Am I doing the most that I can do? What, what satisfaction am I getting and what am I giving? And I really had done about everything at TI that I really wanted to do. There, I would change jobs every five to six years inside the company. And whenever I felt like I wasn't challenged, I would go on to the next thing. And, and um, I loved the last job that I had as chief citizenship officer. But quite honestly, there wasn't an appetite to continue to grow that role. And so I felt like it was going to, to still be great work, but there were very capable people there that could do that work. And so I started thinking about, do I want to do something else? I'd been a career TI'er and I could have certainly stayed there, but what else could I do? And I just had this gnawing feeling that I really wanted to do something else um, as a Trisha 2.0 is what I called it. So I let my management know about a year before I actually left TI that it would be my intent to leave and retire at the end of my 30 years, at the end of that year. And so we had enough time for transition and all those kind of things that you would normally do there. But uh, I just, you know, you sort of get that feeling that it's, it's time to do something else. And, and uh, you know, the timing was, was just perfect. And I, I knew the person who was the former leader of the food bank. And I had actually two or three other opportunities that I was evaluating at the same time. But my husband was the one that actually said, you're going to the food bank. And because every time I would come in after talking to someone about the food bank or learning a little bit more about it, I just became more and more excited. And I think part of the reason for that was whenever I was able to travel the world with TI, it didn't matter whether you were in China, whether you were in India, or, or where it was, the most basic of needs is having access to nutritious food. And you know that students can't learn if they're worried about, you know, the rumble in their tummy. And uh, education's always been extremely important to me. That was really, my brother and I were very fortunate and I'm very, very blessed to have had the parents that we did. They didn't have the opportunity to go to college. They didn't even have the opportunity to finish high school, but they knew the value of education. And they wanted to make sure that my brother and I had access to education and that they supported us all along the way. Well, I sort of rewind that. So I've always been an ed education advocate, but some of the students that we were working with, and you heard some of the organizations I've been involved with, what we would see is many of them weren't able to go to college because they had to go to work. They couldn't go to college or, you know, they were struggling in school academically just because they didn't have access to nutrition at home. So I thought, what better way to lift up a community than to be able to go into something where we could provide food for people to help them to offset that need while they were trying to, to uh, get beyond whatever current circumstances they were in. Yeah, that, what a beautiful story. Um, what would, how would you describe those differences between the corporate and the nonprofit worlds? You know, I think there's so many similarities because I think part of the value that I brought to the food bank and as well as the executive team, many of those that I hired uh, whenever I came here, is a lot of the, the learning and trainings and just things that I would take for granted at TI, you don't always see as common practice. 
for example, one of the first things that I did whenever I wanted to come to the food bank, I did an inter enterprise risk management assessment. You know, I wanted to understand what could shut us down, what are the big risks and what could we do? One of the big things there, and of course me and my background, was technology. We didn't even have, we are, you know, our servers weren't even stable to keep us going. And I know we're struggling with that today, even on, you know, this call with the internet, but but you know, that was critical to us. And I mean, when we're running a 230,000 square foot warehouse and an inventory management system and online ordering and all these things that we were doing, we needed to have a reliable system. And so, you know, just being able to bring in some of these practices to sort of bring in that whole risk mitigation and what do we need to do and, and using data-driven metrics and scorecards and those things into the nonprofit space was, was incredible. However, conversely, what I've learned is being an executive here, you know, coming from a technology engineering company, it's about how you drive and how you can get results and what you're able to do. And you sort of, everybody comes along with you. When you go to the nonprofit side, you know, obviously I'm here for the mission. That's number one. But sometimes how I share that may not come across that way because I'm so very much a driver and results forward focused. So what I had to learn is, how do I translate how this process or how something that we're doing differently is really focused and it's gonna help us better serve that person that we're trying to get food on the table. And I, it was really important to talk about the why, because sometimes you don't talk about the why as much in the corporate world. You talk about what's it gonna to take to get to that bottom line of increasing shareholder value. Well, our shareholder value is for those people that we're serving, and also for those investors who are our donors, making sure that they can get the best social return on their investment versus what you might see as a financial ROI on the corporate side. That's great. <clears throat> can you tell us about one or two experiences that led to your current role? Sure, you know, I, um, I, I sort of talked a little bit about my background of sort of why I made the decision to, to move, but I have been involved in nonprofits for oh, over 15 years. Um, I, TI was, like I said, a wonderful company. They really invested in me as far as my leadership development. And one of the programs I was involved with was more of a global leadership program. And we had people from you know Tanzania, from Canada, from different locations. And, and what you really found is that, you know, at the core, everyone is a human and we have very many of the main basic needs. And even from the leadership standpoint, where leadership for women in particular has come, uh, you know, we're, we're so fortunate here in the U.S. to be where we are. And I, I have always felt that need that if I've been given something, I've got to be able to help give back as well. And so that leadership and helping uh, in particular women leaders make sure that they have the opportunity to continue to grow and advance. Um, and even, you know, right now, I know it's a very timely issue on these issues of, of racial equity as well, too. You know, I'm very much believe that that everyone should have an opportunity and we should try to break down barriers for people because we're TI was a very diverse organization and we really embraced that, that area of diversity. And so whenever you look at this and you think about sort of where we can make the most difference, how do we break down those divides and how do we give everyone an equal opportunity? And I think that's what really led me into wanting to, to do something that would make a difference there. Uh, here at the food bank, if we look at that, if you, it, people of color, are food insecure at a rate of two to one versus their Caucasian counterparts. So typically we serve about 30% Caucasian, 30% Hispanic, 30% African American. Whenever you look at even you know, COVID infections, those who uh, are racially diverse actually have higher incidence of disease and health issues, diabetes, hypertension. So how do we break that down and how can we really make a difference there? And I felt like with food being the most basic of needs, that was absolutely a way that we could try to do that. And how do we do it equitably and make sure that we get food to the highest need areas uh, where we could really make a huge difference? Yeah, those are, perspectives are so important, aren't they? Um, so thinking about reflecting on what you've learned through the years, what advice would you give to your younger self 
while navigating your career? You know, uh, I think it's just to have more confidence in my abilities. I had, you know, I had some wonderful mentors along my way. And some of the great things that they, they've always told me is, if you really are interested in something, you've got to let someone know. Uh, don't just take it for granted that you're going to sit back and you have to wait for someone else to tell you. And I'm going to talk a little bit toward the end here about being bold and what that means. And so I'll relate back some of these things that I've learned along the way. I mean, that would be my advice to my younger self would be to be, be bold and some of the things that I'll, I'll share a little bit later. Wonderful. Well, if you wouldn't mind telling us more about North Texas Food Bank and the great work you and your team are doing there, especially with the pandemic. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks for sharing the slides here. Um, so let's go on to the first slide and I'll just tell you a little bit about this. And so this is the outside of our campus. We just moved to this new campus about two years ago, and again, I, I, I sort of believe in divine intervention sometimes on these things because if we had not had this building, our former facility was about 85,000 square foot and we had an external warehouse as well too, but this one is 230,000 square foot. It sits right in the middle of the 13 counties that we serve. So we go all the way up to the Oklahoma border. We go a couple of counties south of Dallas County in that area, we go out east a little bit. And so we serve urban, suburban, and rural hunger. And it's very different in, in how we are able to serve there. But what's really, I love to tell the story about this, is you see that big X sculpture out front. And if any of you ever get to Dallas, I invite you, let me know when you're coming. I always love to show off our facility and our warehouse, just to be able to, to see that somebody called it a, a Sam's Club on, club on steroids, but I mean, we have a huge facility, we have refrigerated and freezer and all that. But that X, I don't know if any of you know the story that back during the depression, that um, they would put X's on the curb of houses where people could go to the back door and get access to a meal. So you, you may have heard of Ross Perot, uh, his Ross Pro Sr., who passed away about a year ago, his sister Betty was one of the first board members of the North Texas Food Bank. We'll be starting our, we, we were founded in 1982 uh, because there were you know, Ambassador Catherine Hall, you may have heard of Kathy Hall, Catherine Hall Wines. Um, she's the same Kathy Hall that helped start the North Texas Food Bank many years ago. But um, there were four women that got together and they saw a lot of food that was being wasted and saw a lot of hungry people. And they said, how can we make sure that we can help close that gap? Well, the Perot family have been hunger fighters for many years uh, along that way. And so they were instrumental in us having this new building and as part of our capital campaign. But Ross and Betty's mother, Lulu May, was, they lived in Texarkana when they were growing up and they had this X on their curb. and. You know, the kids would sometimes ask, Mom, why do we have that there? And they said, no, don't take that away. She didn't put it there, but they put it there because they said, these people are just like us. They're just a little down on their luck right now. And said, you know, we have to do what we need to do to try to be able to help them. So I really think about that. And I think about that moment in history. And I think about when so many people were facing hungry. And I even fast forward to today because I'll talk a little bit about what we did with COVID. But uh, you know, needs just went up practically overnight. And so every day whenever I walk into the food bank and I see that X, I think about it being th that our country is in crisis again, but what we do here at the food bank, this is a symbol of hope. And it's a symbol of nourishment for so many who are in our community. And so this is called Lulu May's Mark. It was, it was designed by a local Dallas sculptor. And it's just that great reminder, I think, for us and we're extremely grateful that the Perot family has enabled us to be able to be here. But uh, let's go on to the video. I think that'll be next. And that'll tell you a little bit about what we do. Because what I think is a challenge for many is trying to understand what does a food bank do? I think many of you are probably familiar with Needline there in, in Callaway County. That's more of a food pantry. But they get food from larger food banks. So. This, this video will share a little bit about what we do. I call it a nonprofit logistics company. 
You know, we want to try to help close the hunger gap in North Texas by providing access to nutritious foods. We want our community to be healthy. We want our community to be strong. So the North Texas Food Bank acquires food from many different sources. We get food from government support through many different programs there. We get it from food wholesalers, distributors, people that donate food. We purchase food and we take all of that food and we bring it into the North Texas Food Bank. And then we distribute that out through many different sources. We have over 200 dedicated partner agencies that 80% of our food goes through on a daily basis. Then the rest of the food goes out directly from the North Texas Food Bank. These could be seen your programs or children's programs and then our third major program that we have is our mobile pantry program we can take our mobile units out into areas where they may not have access to food In a typical year, we see roughly 40,000 volunteers coming through the Perot Family Campus to help us sort and kit uh, different types of food in order to get it out of the food bank and into the partner agencies and into the hands of those that need it. The first step that happens is we receive it and we take a look at it for quality. Is it expired? Is it spoiled? And we separate that out. The next thing that happens is that we'll separate it into like types. So uh, we'll have large bins that are full of just canned green beans. After that, those large bins then that are separated by type go into smaller cartons. The cartons then are palletized, put in the warehouse. Once it's in the warehouse, it's available in an online ordering system to our partner agencies. So once they place their orders, we then will either deliver the food to them that they've ordered, uh, or they can come pick it up from us. Uh, and obviously they do that last mile of the distribution to the actual clients for most of the food. So Crossroads acts as a hub for the North Texas Food Bank. So the food bank sends literally truckloads of food. Then we have our own pantry in which we are standing and we serve quite a few people through there. There's also North Texas Food Bank agencies that we serve as well as what we call community distribution partners. And that allows for this equitable distribution and more efficient distribution throughout the community. So when you think about the future and what's next for the food bank after we've hit the 92 million meal mark, we want to be able to sustain that. We're continuing to build on our operational efficiencies. We're continuing to be very strategic in how we're serving our community as well too, to make sure that anyone has access to the food that they need. That was awesome. So glad that you chose to share that video today. Thank you for that. Um, so continuing on with our conversation, we'd love to know what are some practical virtues you followed or core values that have allowed you to become successful? So yeah, we'll go on to the next slide. Uh, one of the first things whenever I came to the food bank that I wanted to make sure that we got aligned on with our team, we have about 180 people that work here and they had gone through an extremely difficult transition. They had lost a very beloved leader. She was an icon in our community, and unfortunately, she got cancer and passed away, so they were still grieving for them. They had an interim leader, but I thought it was extremely important to make sure that we, we figure out what we stand for, and so what you see on uh, the screen is our, is our three core values, and we have these up in our public volunteer space whenever it comes in, and it's around integrity, compassion, and collaboration. And this is what the measuring stick that we want people to make sure that we are both internally with our own employees as well as externally, that this is the way that we operate. And because we have the mission of trying to close the hunger gap here in North Texas by providing access to nutritious food, we think it's just as important to have uh, nutritious food in your body is to have anything in there because we know that people that are food insecure do have more health issues than people that aren't. So for example, here in North Texas, we have about one out of every five people experience hunger. That means that, and whenever I talk food insecurity, that just means that they don't really know where their next nutritious meal is coming from or whether they'll have dinner on the table or whether they'll be able to feed their family that evening. For children in our community, it's one in four. And if you think about what the impact of COVID, before COVID hit, we had actually reduced the food insecurity number here in our community to the lowest it had, it had been even prior to the Great Recession, you know, in sort of the 2008, 2009 period. 
but now practically overnight we're higher than it's ever been. And the 13 counties that we serve here in North Texas, uh, for children in particular, it is the fifth highest number of food insecure children in the country, which is just mind blowing that, you know, and a huge responsibility. And, uh, you know, you talk a little bit about the difference between a nonprofit and a for-profit, you know, it, in the for-profit, whenever I was able to go home, I certainly was rewarded by how I performed and the, what I was able to do and going above and beyond. But, you know, sometimes whenever I go home with just this job, you can't leave it. It is certainly weighing on your shoulders knowing that somebody may be going to, to bed hungry that evening. And so that's why we, we're trying to do everything that we can to try to, to be able to meet those needs as well. Yeah, I, I think we've all watched that our community as well, realizing that increase that the, pan the pandemic has um, created. And so being on the front line like you are, can you tell us what that's been like? You know, I will say that middle of March, uh, as here, and I know it's had a little bit longer before really it, it became critical stages there in Kentucky. My mom still lives there. My mother-in-law still lives there. And, and sort of hearing from them, it's been a little bit more delayed than what we saw up front because it sort of hit urban areas first and then the suburban and, and rural areas. But uh, literally we had to do, we had to do a 180 degree turn on just about everything we did. The first thing that we saw was that our volunteers went away. Uh, we literally had corporate representatives that would meet their volunteer. We have 40,000 volunteers typically on an annual basis. So think about that workforce that we would typically have coming in and then them not showing up for work. Um, and so we had to figure out how do we, how do we do this? Because typically all those pallets of food that you saw in the video, we would distribute those to our partner agencies because about 80% of our food goes through there. Well, guess what? You couldn't safely distribute this in a very small like pantry grocery store environment where they got to choose the food. So we had to figure out how do we pivot to, to and I hate that word pivot, but I mean, it really is the best word sometimes, but how do you do go to a drive through model that you can safely distribute food there like what you see into a trunk? And so that required higher labor, higher expense with boxes. We had to source more food because we would rely a lot on donated food and product but when you're putting together nutritionally balanced food boxes, you have to have a lot of the same type of inventory in order to be able to put into those boxes. And so that was a, a huge thing that we had to be able to do as far as how do we source the food? How do, who do we work with? At the same time, you had the whole supply chain with the grocery stores that was, you know, their shelves were empty. Well, guess what? They're getting restocked from the same type of, of uh, food manufacturers, food growers that we were purchasing from as well. So these were all things we had to navigate. Plus we got to sort of learn about new things. We, we put in a request for the National Guard to be able to support us. And so while our team is about 180, we had about 280 National Guard people that were servicemen and women who we were extremely grateful for because they helped us during a real critical time as we were ramping up our operation. But they worked in our warehouse, drivers, and the distributions and kitting boxes because we needed that, that manpower. We also worked um, with other partners in the community. So we piloted a new method. You know, oftentimes crisis will force innovation and we had to figure out this manpower situation. We realized that there were so many hospitality industry workers who were without jobs practically overnight when all the restaurants were shut down and people couldn't go eat, but then that meant people were, were not, didn't have jobs. So we worked on a partnership with um, our board chair at the time. He, what, he's a venture capitalist and invest in, in companies and one of the companies he invested with had a technology that was basically for shift work. Well, how could we apply that for this volunteer? So we worked with our local communities foundation with this technology, Shift Smart, to be able to source specifically these hospitality industry workers so that they were paid by this fund to be able to come and give their time here at the food bank for labor at a time whenever we needed it. And obviously we had to do the same things as every other businesses did in order to meet the CDC requirements, 
for all the safety measures and the social distancing and we had to redesign our volunteer floor to make sure that there could be space between there. We had to go off and get a couple of extra warehouses to make sure that we could have uh, a safe, you know, wider distribution area. We put some of our National Guard over in a separate volunteer kitting area. So everything had to be ramped up. Even what you see there, uh, that gentleman there putting the boxes in the back, that was one of our mobile distribution lines. Uh, we typically would take our mobile pantry units out to a location before COVID hit, and we might serve 200 to 300 families at a site. Now, we typically serve between 1,000 and 2,000 households at one of those sites. So you talk about scale, that's, that's what we had to scale to. And this Saturday, um, one of those locations was at Fair Park. We've seen lines of cars that stretch for miles. Someone got in line at 1.45 in the morning for a, a nine o'clock distribution. People don't do that unless they need food. She needed food for her family. And we're going back to Fair Park on Saturday for a distribution and we're expecting to serve about 8,500 households. Yeah, that's just amazing. Um, and what you've done really speaks to leadership. Um, and as we enter this new season of giving that's coming up, um, I know you've spoken to MSU and the women leaders about what you referenced earlier about being bold. And for those that weren't able to be a part of that session, can you tell us a little bit more about that and how it relates to serving? Sure, yeah, no problem at all. We can go ahead and take the slides down for now if you want, because I'll just sort of talk a little bit about this and, um, um, and feel free to, to interject, Robin, if you have any questions through here. And, and certainly if people have questions, you can put those in the chat as well too. But yeah, whenever I first came there, I was part of the leadership women and I was on the board and, and I love coming back to our alma mater. And I see Lena online as well too, Lena Porter. So thanks for joining Lena. But uh, Lena was really instrumental in helping to bring that program to the campus of Murray State for the women leaders there. And it was just such a joy to be there. But one of the first sessions I talked about being bold. And I thought more and more about this during the pandemic and, and actually wrote a little blog about it because I think what we talked about with being bold so much relates to, to how we can serve as well. And so there's some lessons there, but the B is about believing in yourself and others. And again, as you talk about what would I tell my younger self, that's part of it is, you know, we, we all have inherently skills that are unique to us. And we have to be able to use they, those in an effective way. And also, when we hire a great team, like I have here at the North Texas Food Bank, and like others that I've worked with at TI, you know, you've got to entrust them to do your work. Someone told me one time, only make the decisions that only you can make. Because what we wanted to do is to create a culture of empowerment and then accountability. And so as leaders, that's part of our job is to help sort of break down barriers for those leaders, help prioritize, and then to support their efforts and then let them succeed and, and let them know that they have the support, and, but not any one person can do it by themselves. Even though I may be the CEO here, I could not be successful in this role without everyone else. And so during our pandemic response, I had to trust the team. I had to rely on their areas of expertise here. And uh, what we found is that, you know, that we saw leadership capabilities and unique skills and talent across our organization that uh, we never would have seen before if we had not taken that and given people an opportunity to be able to believe in their own unique skills. And so, so if you apply this from a service standpoint, many of you here on this call have unique skills and talents that you can contribute. And we all do, right? So even whenever I started working in the nonprofits so many years ago, I came in with certain skills and talents that I could help that nonprofit with. Uh, you know, you may have a great IT skill set and you may be able to enhance them being able to do an assessment of their technology or help them to build a website. So sometimes it's not just about contributing uh, money or, or having sort of a, a fancy influential network or something. Everyone can make an impact. And so you just have to believe in your skills. And then it also gives you an opportunity to sort of exercise those skills in a, in a different way as well. So believe in others and the unique skills and talents of other people. Then the O for bold is being open to new opportunities. This is something that someone else actually shared with me whenever I was at TI and I was sort of younger in my career. 
They said, if somebody asks you to do something, you better think twice before you turn it down because that means that they do have confidence in you and they have belief in your opportunities. And so don't just think, well, my plate's too full. Uh, think about, okay, can I learn something here? How can I contribute? What has this person seen in me that they're asking me to be able to do something? So here at NTFB, we had to completely pivot, as I said, whenever the pandemic came on in order to be able to safely serve our community. So all these plans and everything that we had in place that we were moving towards sort of had to be put on the sideline to be able to be flexible and nimble to meet the demands of sort of the new environment. So that service and leadership, we, we know that it all requires flexibility. You, have, you can't just be very rigid in how you lead. You have to sometimes work in a very dynamic environment, which is what we've had to do. And sometimes you have to flex your muscles a bit and get sore in order to grow and be a little bit stronger. I think some of the times those things that stress you make you stronger in the long run. So if you take this to a service aspect, think about what's gonna put you a little bit out of your comfort zone. How can you serve your community? Is there, uh, you know, is there a place that you could be an expert in a cause or an area that you could make a difference? You know, we're extremely grateful here at the food bank whenever we have new volunteers and most of them are not experts in the day-to-day -day issue of hunger. They just wanna help. But we have to know the complexities and then we have to figure out how do we use them and their time and their resources to help support us. I talked about those 40,000 volunteers. You know, if we didn't allow them to come in and help us, uh, you know, we would not be able to serve our community in the way that we have been. So think about organizations that are close to your heart. I've always found that if you find something that you're passionate about, you're willing to invest the extra time and muscle. I used to work with our executives at TI and they'd say, well, I think I need to get involved in the community. My very first question would be, so what are you passionate about? What do you care about? And some people would care about the arts. Some people would care about children. Some people would care about basic needs. And so we always tried to make sure that we could introduce them to organizations that could use their skills and talents but also something that they could be passionate about as well. And then you'll want to make sure that they continue to grow and that they continue to uh, stretch beyond even where they thought they could be possible as well. The other thing I would just say on this too, as sort of being open to new opportunities, when I first started serving on those nonprofit boards, I purpose, purposely tried to get on committees that I know would not only help the, the org, but would also stretch my skills. So my degree was computer information systems, but I was typically working in more of the marketing and communications and some of those backgrounds whenever I came into TI. So initially they would always want to put me on the marketing committee and I did chair marketing committees and did things like that. But I also tried to chair, I chaired the finance committees. I've chaired development and fundraising committees. I've chaired governance committees. I've chaired all these other areas that gave me an opportunity to also stretch my own skill set in a very safe space, but it would still provide a benefit back to the organization. And I can tell you all those experiences have made me better in my current role as well. So we've talked about B, believing in yourself and others, and O, being open to other opportunities. And so let's talk about the L. That's about leadership, your own leadership, and also the leadership of others. So lead and be led. Sometimes you don't always have to be the person at the front of the line. It's important to be able to leverage all the strengths of the people that are uh, on your team. So when the pandemic hit, you know, it was not business as usual for the food bank. We had so many team members that we tried to send home if they could work from home and do their jobs there, but we needed, it was all hands on deck in our distribution and warehouse and our operations and volunteer team there. So we had so many team members that sort of flexed their skills and set up, stepped up to new challenges. And actually as a result of that, we found some really strong leaders in our organization that are now leading in other areas. So in these times of uncertainty, just know that your leadership is really valued. You know, we have a husband and wife team, Jill and Max, who actually received our volunteer award this year. And they went from, they started working with us two years ago after they had retired. Uh, and then they've increased their volunteer efforts to five days a week during COVID. So they are here five days, eight hours a day, helping to make sure that our volunteer uh, warehouse activities and our kidding activities 
uh, are, they're like an extension of our staff. They lead their own production lines. They help to train some of the National Guard whenever they came in. Uh, they sort of blaze new trails of things that needed to be done differently. And, but because they had a commitment to our mission and they have just been a true inspiration to us. But I can tell you that neither Jill nor Max have a nonprofit or hunger relief background. They are both retired executives from Frito-Lay, uh, but they had a passion to be able to use their time and skills in a different way. So they stepped right in, they weren't shy, and they worked extremely well with us. So I would just say here is, you know, it's a, be, use your leadership skills in a different role. And it's, so it's not just about having to volunteer on the front lines. You can look for board opportunities. You can look for committees or councils. But, you know, it may be that you want to, to exercise your leadership even directly with clients that some of those organizations serve. Or you may see a need in your community as well that needs to be fixed. And there may not be anybody serving that need right now. Well, gosh, isn't that a great opportunity for you to be able to step up and bring others along to be able to solve something that may be an issue right in your own community as well. So we've talked about the L, the leadership, and then finally the D is differentiating yourself. You know, we all are not carbon copies of each other. We have to make sure that we have different skills and we sort of bring others on the team that, that have and complement those skills. You have to be aware of what's happening. But at the end of the day, you have something that no one else has. And making sure that you exercise that and that you can differentiate yourself in that way is important. So think outside the box. Use those critical thinking skills and analytical skills that I know that you have and that you look at problems there either at the university or in your other areas as, as alumni. Make sure that you can, can do that. You know, you truly can make a huge difference. And we use our board members. We have an advisory board. We have former board members and we bring them problems. So one of our problems, we just had a conversation with some of our board today was, you know, obviously with these increased needs, that there have been some government programs that have been helping us to meet those needs today. Well, guess what? Right now, most of those government programs end at the end of the year. So we're gonna have to figure out how do we supplement that gap? Because obviously it takes a lot of financial resources like 4.3 million per month just to meet the value of what we're providing right now for COVID. It takes a lot of financial resources. So we need, we're trying to activate as many people that we have in our network to figure out how can we get bulk food donations that will help us to continue to be able to serve if we are not able to see government programs renewed. So that's been, uh, you know, sort of fantastic to be able to see how people are sort of thinking differently and out of the box. So use those unique skill sets and relationships. And, and I know that Tina said that we are gonna be showing this as well to, to probably some of the students in classrooms as well. I would just say to those students, don't think that just because you're not in a professional career right now that you can't make a difference because I've seen too many students that have worked with us here uh, that are making a huge difference in their communities and making it stronger. Service work is an excellent opportunity to career paths. So learn and develop your own skills and your own professional network. And because all those people that you're meeting and some of those service learning opportunities are actually people that you can also leverage along your professional journey as well. So I think I will just end it there. You know, I think, um, um, I want to make sure Tina has time for her special announcement here at the end too, but you know, we are so, I think, lifted up by our community and we know that um, there are so many people that have found themselves uh, in a situation where they haven't had access to food. And I often think about, you know, what if that were me? What if I were one of those people? And I can tell you that I have great comfort in knowing that there's no stigma attached to needing a little extra help. And that uh, the fact that every day we get to come in and make a difference is great. So I would urge you to support Needline if you're in Callaway County or if, um, you know, you're somewhere else, support your local food pantries because I can tell you right now they are on the front lines of helping to offset some of the needs from this, the economic situation that COVID has brought us. So uh, thank you for the opportunity. If there are any questions, I'm happy to answer if you have time. Thank you so much, Tricia. And yes, please send in your questions via chat. The ones that I've received already, you've answered. <laughs> okay. 
So yeah, great job. Um, yeah, for sure. Um, I did have a couple ask for your, uh, for a contact information, uh, your email address or something like that. Tricia, can you share that? I'll type us? it in the chat. Okay, great. And then I'll share, we'll share that out. Um, we will send a link um, to everyone after the event and we'll include uh, your email address in that link, Tricia. That'd be great. And here it is too. Thank you so much. Anybody else have any questions? We've got some comments that this is the best one yet. So great job. <laughs> great job. Okay, I'll pay you later. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much. And this has been just your response to the whole pandemic. And oh my gosh, I just can't even imagine the numbers there. I'm a numbers person. And so for me to hear uh, that impact and that need, that's really incredible. And um, it, it definitely just overnight shifted your abilities and for what you thought you believed in and what your organization could do and what you've actually done in response has got to just, you know, astound you, I, I would guess. <laughs> it's been, it's been, it's been crazy, you know, but I will say our team, um, they work tirelessly and I mean, many Herculean efforts to make sure that they were not leaving one person unserved that needed food on their table. We literally had even some elected officials call us and say, you know, Aunt Jeannie down the street said that she didn't get whatever and, and she's hungry and can you help? Oh. And so we would work with one of our partners to make sure that Aunt Jeannie could get some, some <laughs> assistance. And, you know, we serve about a million people. And so, you know, you think about that one Aunt Jeannie, but that one Aunt Jeannie was really important and we had to make sure that we could make sure that that person was served as well too. So as you go into this holiday season and season of service as well, try to make sure how you can make a difference and try to follow your passions. Thank you, thank you for that. And Robin, thank you so much for helping uh, and moderating today as well. We appreciate your help. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, and as Trisha alluded to as well, we do have some exciting news to announce today. And I had introduced briefly at the beginning uh, of the presentation today, Brian Kennedy and Melanie Brooks of our team. Uh, and there are others on our team here as well. I see Jenny Roddinghouse. Uh, and others too, but um, Brian and Melanie had specifically uh, joined me in working. We're, we're so fortunate um, to be able to help facilitate vision of our alumni and donors and join them on their journey uh, to seeing how their contributions can make a dramatic impact on our students and our community here at Murray State. And few donors have supported the vision and growth of a program at Murray State more than Dr. Bob and Patricia Long have done for the nonprofit leadership program. So they're on the call here today. They envisioned uh, establishing a giving back endowment uh, that funds innovation and learning about philanthropy for not only our students, but also for our faculty. They have been loyal givers to the nonprofit resource fund for the greatest needs of the program and department. And today I'm honored to announce that they have taken a new step in that journey and have established the Dr. Robert and Patricia Long Endowed Faculty Fellowship for Nonprofit Leadership Studies. And this significant gift of over $100,000 will endow a fund that will provide long-term support for the director of the NLS program here, allowing us to recruit and retain the best and brightest from across the country to Murray State. Uh, as an institution, we've been honored to have Dr. Long with his nationally recognized credentials teaching in our program, and this will allow us to ensure that we continue to have that quality after his full retirement, which I'm not sure we're going to allow him to do. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. He's going to need special permission from someone, um, but this is the first faculty fellowship for the NLS program and in the Department of Organizational Communication and Leadership in the Byron Fine College of Business. So setting more firsts here. And we thank Dr. and Mrs. Long so much 
for making, uh, for making this possible and leading the way uh, and for the, their continued loyalty in this program. And Dr. and Mrs. Long join us today from their home along with uh, Dr. David Eaton, Dr. Mike Bacchino, and we, we are so happy to be able to thank them sort of in person uh, here for working to develop this high quality program our students need for them to become racers in the lead. Um, so Dr. Wong, would you like to say a couple words to the group? We have to allow you to unmute here. Hold on just a second. Okay. I think you can. Okay, I think I'm unmuted. Yes. Uh, well, uh, Tricia, thank you for a wonderful presentation and uh, for the time you gave to our uh, nonprofit uh, course uh, on giving and philanthropy. That evening was just marvelous. and. The example that you provided to those students was inspiring, so I wanted to say thank you. Uh, you know, um, we're where we are because of um, of you. you know, I see Steve Cox is the person who recruited me to teach a course in Word Column, as we called it at the time, the first class I taught when I came here. And I guess the reason that we were inspired to make this gift, and it should be the Patricia and Robert, not the Robert and Patricia, so please change that titling. Um, you got it. <laughs> at, this, at the heart of every organization, regardless of what its uh, orientation or structure is, government, business, or, or civil society, nonprofit based organizations is communication. And that's the driver, the capacity to inspire and connect and communicate through which we lead each other and we affect change. And so when sitting with, um, uh, with uh, Michael Bacchino, who really made this happen by his uh, commitment to our program, it was uh, the language of legacy that really raised up for the design of it, uh, Michael. The idea that organizational communication and leadership is the title of the work we do. So what we hope the uh, fellowship will allow is for the work that lies ahead that we haven't thought of yet. The new courses, the new alignments of curriculum that are about leadership through communication to affect positive change in the world. And while that sounds lofty, it just sounded lofty as I said it, it is absolutely what we are doing every day with our students. So now let's think about organizational communication and leadership, regardless of the type of organization, uh, and we will affect greater change through this work. And yes, at the end of this uh, spring semester, I will be fully retired again. Uh, but thanks to everybody on the call who's helped uh, this happen and inspired uh, us to make this gift. Uh, Robin and, and, and Mike uh, in, on the faculty uh, and particularly again, uh, Michael Bacchino for uh, uh, inviting us in uh, to the department. So thank you. We're, we're thrilled to be able to help. Well, thank you both so very much. And this has been just a wonderful afternoon. And Tricia, Robin, thank you again, both of you. And thank you all for joining us. And you've made, this is our last installment of our fall virtual event series, Racers in the Lead. And it's really been a wonderful experience for all of us to help organize and talk with our alumni and donors. This has been a really exciting, exciting uh, semester in terms of that opportunity. So uh, we've enjoyed bringing people to campus from all over who, who still, you know, even though we're, we're distanced, um, we're able to be together. So thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful afternoon as we approach the holiday and season of giving. Please give of yourself and through service, uh, your time, talent, and treasure. There's someone in your community that needs your help. So thank you so much to everyone and have a wonderful afternoon and go racers. <laughs>